Hello and welcome to Quackalope. Today we are covering a brand new game, Sea of Legends by Guildhall mm -hmm. Studios. Now, Jan, this game is a... Oh, it's a few things. So first off, it's a narrative adventure game. Okay. Number one. Sure. It's a so. pandemic board state management game as well. Okay. Tableau building. Yep. And point collection. Yeah. I, okay. think that's, I think that sums it up pretty well. <laughs> There's a few little elements, but they all work very well together. Thematically. We are pirates trying to solidify our adventures in history, become true legends. Doing things like taking down big bads, conquering ports, gaining and burying enough gold, upgrading your ship, upgrading your crew, gathering. There's a few things. We'll get to it soon. <laughs> gathering relics. <laughs> And going on your story-driven narrative yes. adventures, there mm -hmm. are seven core elements or components of this game mm -hmm. that all lead and build to you earning and gaining that legendary status. Notoriety. That notoriety that mm -hmm. you need to win the game. Now, if this is the first time you're coming across a Quackalope video, hey. or specifically a Quackalope how to play, whether you're coming kind of from our channel, mm -hmm. YouTube, or the Kickstarter page itself, welcome. Hi. We're glad to have you here. Nice, nice for you to stop by or, or <laughs> sail through. We do things a little bit differently. I, we, we try to do things a little bit differently when it comes to our how to play videos. We're, we try to be a little bit more conversational than average. Mm -hmm. Like um, if you're sitting across the table from us, right? Riffing back and forth, mm -hmm. trying to uh, ask questions, pose answers, and figure out a way to teach the game to you as consistently but also accessibly as possible. Yeah. It sometimes takes a little bit longer. It does. Because Jan minutes. likes to talk quite a bit. <laughs> but along the way, we hope by the end of this video, you will not only have a sense of the flow and the structure of this game, but honestly, more or less, how to table it when you get it For into sure. your hands. Mm -hmm. Along with that, we want to acknowledge that this is a prototype copy of the game. Yes, 100%. It looks super finished, but there might be some differences from what you see here to what you'll get in your box. So yeah. keep that in so mind. So make sure you're double checking some of those key, like, minute rules mm -hmm. or specifics depending on what sort of heroes, villains, and factions you have involved in your core game. There's a lot of modularity when it comes to this game, so we'll be touching on the overview and the general structure of the game state, mm -hmm. uh, whereas your game state, when you get it to your table, will probably have variants or potentially even videos that need to cover some of the bad guys. Oh yeah, new factions. As like <laughs> solo self-contained little media pieces. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out for those down the road anyway. And. Uh, I think we should say thank you to Guildhall Studios for sponsoring this video. Yeah. It's really thanks well, they, to them and publishers that we get to do this in a, in a daily basis, right? No, that's that's true. So, so publishers that sponsor our videos, mm -hmm. like our How to Plays or our Game Plays, really do go a long way in making what we do possible here on the channel. The thank B-roll, the time invested in learning the game, and the <laughs> opportunity to bring it to you all the fans. So. If you like what we are doing here, leave a comment over on the Kickstarter letting them know that you watched and enjoyed this video uh, and hit that subscribe button down below. Please. So uh, the structure of this how to play video. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna start with an overview. Yep. We'll explain how the game works, essentially what you're trying to do. Talk about win condition. How? To, what are you working towards? What is sure. the objective? After that, we'll go into a very brief overview of all the components on the board so that when we go into specifics later on, you know what we're talking about. You have a sense of what the layout is here. After that, we're going to go into the structure and flow mm -hmm. of the game. What a turn's gonna look like, what's gonna happen if there's bad guys populating the board, mm -hmm. how attack, rolling dice, movement, and the story-driven narrative works. Yep. And then we're gonna tell you thank you for watching and probably encourage you to hit the subscribe button or something after you've spent time listening to us teach you how to play a game that yeah. hopefully you'll enjoy, whatever the case. Let's get to it. Let's go ahead and start swinging into this. Now, the first thing I want to acknowledge right from the very beginning is the fact that we have an iPad sitting between oh, us. Oh, no. This is a game that the story-driven element of it mm -hmm. does involve an app. Yes. Right? And we have a beta prototype copy mm -hmm. of that app up and running, functioning, uh, interweaving these narrative-driven mm -hmm. stories. Now, before you click off, I think that at least a percentage of you will be having the same reaction to an app-driven mm -hmm. game that I personally do most of the time. Yeah. And that is, honestly, app-driven games aren't often right for me. But the reason being is because more often than not, the app-driven game feels like it supplements the game mm -hmm. and actually takes away from the core experience. Yeah, but not here. In this case, the app portion of this game is integrated in a way that I think genuinely enhances the core experience of Sea of Legends. Mm -hmm. The reason being, we will explain this as we teach the how to play, and you can che check the gameplay to see how it actually functions. But you will have a hero, a lover, and a villain, or a nemesis. Mm -hmm. And all of these cards are double-sided, so they can yep. function as any one of those roles. 
including a variety of asymmetric evil powers and different people playing the game. And what they'll do essentially is that they're going to influence the board state and they're going to interweave actually with your characters, yep. with my characters, with other players' characters, and even some of the NPCs that are going to be populating the board a little bit. So the app is going to drive the something like seven or 800 pages mm -hmm. of custom text and generated script that they have available for this game mm -hmm. and all the characters across the board. The reason for that is that my players, my heroes, my villains, my lovers interweave with the other people mm -hmm. around the game state. And as the narrative changes, depending on what adventures we go on, the text in the actual app or the actual narrative of the game will flow in and out of each other. Yep. So your lover might end up being involved with my nemesis. And there might even be consequences to the actions you do where you'll spawn a new type of activity on the board yep. that anyone could go visit. So and it's so trying to keep in mind all that, all those things. Without the app involved, you it literally, will. well, you literally have a tome of notes, but on top yeah. of that, as someone that likes narrative driven stuff, honestly, what you'd have, and you've seen it in other video games before, mm -hmm. you'd have something that said, uh, you're doing this insert player name here mm -hmm. or insert heroine name here. Or if this world event has happened, reference point A, one mm -hmm. B, and depending on which hero or villain or nemesis is involved in the game currently, go to subsection C. It's a lot of things. The app is running that script behind the mm -hmm. scenes, which I think genuinely does enhance and improve the opportunity for a narrative-driven game, allowing you to be immersed in those interwoven stories. Yeah, and, and my favorite thing is that it lets you focus on the game, on the yeah. gameplay itself. So, that's one just side thing. Honestly, apps usually aren't right for me. I think this one is integrating it in a way that actually enhances the game state. Mm -hmm. So, I wanted to make sure I addressed that right off the beginning. And so, let's go ahead and swing into an overview of the game state. What is the theme and what is the win condition? So, what we're trying to do is weave our legend through the Caribbean. We will do that through going on adventures, burying treasure, doing feats of amazing heroics or thievery, whichever you prefer, um, while trying to compete with other pirates that are doing the same thing and malicious NPCs that are working towards their own personal asymmetric agendas. Yeah. Okay. The way that you'll do that is by gaining notoriety. Every time you go on these different types of venues, you will gain points. Whoever reaches 10 notoriety or 10 points wins yep. the game. However, there will be a round there, so you'll be able to catch up and you can steal things, but we'll get to that Now, soon. I sprinted through those notoriety just a moment <laughs> ago. Go ahead and outline the different ways you can earn points mm -hmm. throughout the course of this game. And let's make sure that we get this right. There sure. are seven ways to gain notoriety. Absolutely. Okay. So the first one is going through adventures. So every character or every player is going to have a captain, a lover, and a nemesis. Each of those different players or NPCs are actually going to be completely separate storylines that you're going to be able to follow. Yep. If you follow a storyline enough, you'll get to the end point and that will award you with some points. Your lovers give you two points, your nemesis also give you two points, and finally your captain is going to get you three points. Yep. In addition to a bunch of really cool powers, but I digress. The next way that you're going to be able to gain points is by expanding your crew and your ship. So you, throughout the game, will be able to collect special, notorious crew members that might give you additional notoriety. In addition to that, you have ships that you're gonna be able to build and make your vessel stronger and more powerful, mm -hmm. and it'll let you even concentrate on kind of like the, your favorite things about the game. So from that, you can also gain notoriety by collecting relics, special items across the world that hold special power and strength that you'll be able to also employ throughout your adventures. And from there, you'll also be able to visit hideouts. And hideouts are going to let you bury treasure. And you're always going to need seven coins, which are these components right here, in order to bury treasure. And you will get an equivalent of one notoriety from that. Mm -hmm. Another way is by defeating the big boss miniatures that are across the game state. These things are nasty. No, they're insane. Yeah, you definitely, definitely don't want these guys anywhere near you, mm -hmm. okay? And the final thing that you'll be able to do is raid a port. So all of these different marks here on the board are areas that you can visit. And if you have enough crew and enough power, you're able to raid that port and get two things, notoriety, mm and a permanent income that's going to be added I mean, every round. If you control a port, you should at least get a little bit of money for it, right? Yes, you should. So that's gonna be the general mission of the game. Basically, every story progressing thing you do is also going to enhance and increase mm -hmm. your opportunity to win. The first person to get to 10 notoriety points on their turn by the end of the round mm -hmm. is going to be the winner. Yep. That's the end goal. 
pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. complicated to do. Oh, for sure, because other players are going to be able to steal notoriety from you. NPCs might take things that you desperately need for that victory, yep. so you always have to be on your toes. Yeah, there's a lot of things that can happen and go on in the course of the game <laughs> that can sure. foil, foil your plans. Reference mm -hmm. our gameplay if you'd like to see that. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and start with a overview of the components then. Mm -hmm. Let's start here in the center and kind of work our way to the sides. Okay. We already touched briefly on some of these cards and the iconography, mm -hmm. but what's going on in the middle board here? So this is the Caribbean, and the way that this is divided is into different regions. So you have open sea regions and you have island or territory regions. Yep. When you go into an open sea region, nothing happens. But whenever you're on an island location... Unless there's someone to encounter there. Correct. Sure. Correct. But when you're on an island, you're able yep. to do either an adventure, raid the port, or do the action that's specific to that particular island. Yeah, there's different icons that indicate what type of action you can take in those mm -hmm. locations. Along with that, there's flags that denote the amount of power or defense that each location has. Mm -hmm. And also, different ports are going to give you different types of benefits depending on sure. the actions you do there. So from there, we can talk a little bit about the tableau that we're building. So yep. we already touched on this a little bit. Um, we have our captain, our nemesis, and our lover. They're not just dressing for the story. They're actual gameplay factors that are going to transform how you play your game. The entire narrative of the game will change based on them. And this story that you have to go through, the boons and progression that you mm -hmm. can make will be based around them. Now, here's the interesting thing. Your heroes... Yeah, our uh, captains. Are, ...are randomized. So I could have this one, you could have that one. Mm -hmm. They could pair up with either of our lovers or nemesis. Yep. And along with that, these lovers and nemesis will be drafted at the start too. They are entirely reversible or flippable yep. as well. So the person I was in love with for this game... You might, might be your worst enemy in the next one. Might be your nemesis <laughs> in the next one, or your lover in this game could be my lover in the next one. They're all cross-compatible, which mm -hmm. is fascinating when it comes to the game state of the app. Like I said, this amalgamation of different narrative mm -hmm. elements all interweave and tie together in a really fascinating way. Thanks to so this app. So. at the very start of the game, you're going to have three options. Mm -hmm. You're going to choose a lover, a nemesis, and discard one of them. And yep. then you're going to populate your ship and your crew. Yeah, and that's super important. So the way the main mechanic in this game is going to be resolved through dice rolling. So there's actually a lot of ways that you can mitigate those dice, dice rolls. Dice rolling and specifically dice mitigation. Yes. That's a big key to this. Mm -hmm. Because your crew members, and actually remember when I said that your lover and your nemesis are going to add gameplay value as well, yep. they're going to let you change the state of the board or those dice rolls that you're going to be doing. The so, farther you progress through their mm -hmm. stories, the more of those abilities and abilities to mitigate the dice you're rolling mm -hmm. get unlocked and get progressed. Yeah. So your crew is going to be able to do different things, and also your ship is going to give you a certain range of actions that you're going to be able to take on your turn. They're either going to let you move farther ahead, have more crew members with you, or bring in some cannons to defend yourself with, mm. okay? So there's a lot of variability in that tableau. And so throughout the game, as Jesse said, you'll be building that either by getting more crew, by upgrading your ship, or going on some adventures and meeting some uh, mm -hmm. interesting people. So from there, let's actually talk about kind of like the things you'll be collecting, the ways you'll improve your ship, etc. Sure. So we first start off with our tavern cards. So tavern cards are going to be very interesting. There's going to be majorly two types of tavern cards, either a relic card or a consumable. Yeah, so the tavern cards are gonna start off by having a event. Yeah. Right? You're gonna go to the tavern and because pirates always cheat, you're always going to win and resolve oh. whatever the top encounter is. So spitting contest. So I will win mm -hmm. and then I will gain two gold or gain eight gold and unlock my nemesis next ability, which means they're more powerful, but I have more gold. Exactly. And then at the bottom here, we're going to have rumors that start milling mm -hmm. around the tavern itself. So Pegleg Jackie drunkenly mentions a alluring relic at Skull Point. Uh -huh. This will then become a quest that you can go on. You'll be able to go to that location and score more notoriety. Now, mm -hmm. the other option here is going to be consumable items, which are going to be items that you gain immediately and you can use at any point throughout the and you can use at any point throughout your turn. Mm -hmm. So that's going to happen if you go to one of these taverns yep. here, right? So the other things or the other cards you're going to be adding is, as we said, crew. So there's two types of crew, really. There's the upgraded crew that you're going to be able to visit through the different ports. And then there's going to be notorious crew members that you might discover along your travel. Sure. But the crew that you're going to have immediate, immediate access to are going to be right here. And all of these different crew members 
are going to allow you to mitigate dice or affect the board or just move in a way that your other uh, that your other opponents might just not be able to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and finally, from that, we have our ships. So there's two classes of ships. There's class two ships and class three ships, not including the base ship that you start off with. So those ships are going to be able to give you notoriety and, as we said before, customize what type of actions, what things you want to maximize mm -hmm. during your game. So these are quintessential for expanding and moving more quickly across the board and getting things done. Yeah, and that basically covers most of the iconography mm -hmm. down here on the board. We have our taverns that we can go to, we have our carpenter who can upgrade our ship, and we have our recruiting stations where we yep. can gain crew. The last location on the board here is going to be our X, which is gonna be our hideout, yep. and that is where we actually stop to heal and rest mm -hmm. and hide, but also bury seven gold in order to gain notoriety mm -hmm. as well. Now, with all of that covered, I think we can swing over here and look at the cards and what's happening with this Ooh. tableau of nemesis we have. Oh yeah, so the NPCs in the game are all going to be determined at the beginning and they're going to affect the game for the entirety of your campaign. So every game that you play, or at least from our understanding, you're gonna have Spanish galleons. These are gonna be ships that are going to be occupying the board and they're gonna have their own mission to claim control and make sure that the Caribbean itself- They wanna make sure the ports that you've taken over don't remain pirate controlled. Or infested. Or infested, Which yes. is another there's, term we'll get to. some other things that can happen. Basically, <laughs> they are here to defend the state of the Caribbean as a whole. Against, yeah. not only against you, but also against the other big bads that you've selected. Now, in our prototype copy, we were sent two versions mm -hmm. of the big bads. In the yep. core game, my understanding is there is more. a widely asymmetric yeah. group of mm -hmm. evil things to happen in the world state of this game. So for this particular play so for this particular playthrough, obviously we're just gonna to touch on what we have. Speaking of, the Dread Tide. So these are undead hordes that are spamming and spreading their horribleness throughout the Caribbean. They're literally trying to meet up in a single zone, coalesce together into a giant horrific formed <laughs> massive skeleton. Like three mm -hmm. of them combine into this twisted relic of a creature. And what he's trying to do is infect every port possible, and when he reaches an area, he's going infected, and if he ever reaches yeah. five, and all five are infected, you guys lose the game. Now, the core thing to understand about these nemeses, whether you're playing with the undead hordes or the mermaids, which are mm -hmm. the two examples we have, the cards over there are going to determine the actions and the way that they spawn across the board state. Yeah, so the way that this works is that every NPC is gonna have a level. And depending on the type of adventures that you go on, etc., as we've described before, those levels are going to progress, including in this spawn deck. The longer you draw out the game, the more deadly the environment is going to become. Mm. So once you start moving along, you're going to get these spawn cards, and those spawn cards are what go and those spawn cards are going to determine how you move those NPCs or how or what they do in that particular turn. They may say just add an NPC. And that's it. It may say add an NPC and take two additional movement. Every spawn card is different and they'll do different things for each. But it's really important that every time that you activate your NPCs, every single NPC on the board is going to move. Mm. It just depends on who gets added onto the board at that particular time. And I don't think we can forget about our lovely merfolk over here. So our merfolk are pretty much collectors. They're trying to get relics and bring them to the island of Tortuga. If ever the merfolk are able to reach the island of Tortuga with a relic, they will summon their own big baddie, Sipakna. And Sipakna, their objective is to continue collecting those relics. Mm -hmm. So they're going to target anybody that has relics or the easiest way to get that. And if they get enough relics, they win the game and all players lose. Yeah, so you have to deal with this global event happening across the board while you're still trying to accomplish your own personal win condition. Mm -hmm. So that's a sense of the components and structure of the game. Let's start digging into the actual flow. So yep. on a player turn, there's going to be a few different actions that you can take. And it really boils down to a few simple mechanics. Yep. You can attack, visit a port to do things like gain crew mm -hmm. and upgrade your boat or go out on an adventure so you can yep. move across the board state. Yeah, so movement is key in this game. So when you move, you're always going to look at your ship card. Right in the center, you're gonna have a sails icon, and that icon is going to dictate, with the number above, how many movement you can. So for example, this ship, 
lets you move too. So on your turn, you will be able to move that amount of regions across the board. You can end wherever you like. Obviously you wanna progress what you're doing. So you either wanna end on a port in order to fulfill an adventure, take one of the port actions, or maybe even raid that poor, poor mm -hmm. town, or try and target a really juicy NPC because either they're worth a lot of coins. They might or, have a relic that they're carrying. Yep, or they might have stolen money from other players before, and now you can take it from that NPC that's just so weak right now. So that's really mainly what you're going to be doing across the entire game. Move and activate, mm. or attack and you're done. So once you've done that initial movement, you came to a point on the board, right? Mm -hmm. A location where you can resolve one of your three core actions. Yep. Now again, that's going to be attack, visit a port, or go on adventure. Yep. Let's start here with attack. So attacking is going to be very simple. If you're ever on a space with a opposing NPC, you must attack. However, if you're ever on a space with another player, you choose to mm -hmm. attack, okay? That's very important. So if you ever land on a space with an NPC, you'll have to initiate combat. Remember when we talked about dice? This is where they're gonna play in. At the beginning of combat, you will always draw your starting dice, which is a pool of four blue dice. From that point onwards, you are able to look across your crew, across your captain card, your lover card, or even your nemesis to determine what dice get added and you those are bonuses. You might have consumables that are able to be played immediately to add dice. Mm -hmm. Some of your crew members may add some of their own white dice and your nemesis or your hero may have modifiers depending on what you roll. Including your relic cards. So yeah. there's all, so many, there's a plethora of op options so that you can mitigate and or add more successes to that dice roll. After that, you'll roll the dice, determine what you get, and depending on the symbols, you're actually going to be able to allocate those things to special player powers that are going to be determined by your nemesis again and by your lover. Now, the interesting thing about these dice is they're not standard six-sided dice. Mm -hmm. Instead, they have your hero symbol, your lover symbol, and your nemesis symbol, yep. along with a few numbers. Numbers mm -hmm. are gonna be straight up hits. They're gonna yep. be resolved accordingly, right? Your hero, your power, your hero, your lover, and your nemesis will be resolved based on their own personal modifier mm -hmm. cards, always starting with your nemesis consequences yeah. first. Mm -hmm. So as we said, you'll start allocating those dice, and once you are done, if you have no additional cards, you will compare your strength versus the NPC. So every NPC card has their strength listed right there. So our Spanish Galleons have four defense, our Merful Guardians have five, and finally our Undead Soldiers have three. Every NPC card is going to have its own strength value that you have to either match or exceed, okay? So, our Spanish Galleons have four, our Merfolk have five, and finally our Undead Soldiers have three. Unless However, they're there with other people. Yep. So if our Spanish Galleons were here together, their little heart symbol next to their current power level will indicate the buff they get for mm -hmm. other people being yep. involved in this fight. Which is called an ally bonus. So you're always trying to keep them away. You can also, as we said, attack other players. So the way that that's going to work is going to be very similar. Players are going to draft dice, do the exact same thing, and then they're going to compare those results at the end. Here's the trick. When you fight some of the NPCs, Sometimes nothing happens to you. You're mm -hmm. fine. If you lose an NPC battle that you initiated, you get some wounds. It's fine. You lick them off. It'll be okay. But when you fight another player, you're going to lose half your gold or they're going to be able to steal one of your relics, which remember are one of the ways End that you win points. the game. Yes. Yep. So it's a tricky, tricky thing to decide, and you have to be very careful whenever you do decide to go on the offensive. Now, an important element when it comes to engaging battles that mm -hmm. we need to address immediately is the state of the NPCs around the game. So yeah. let's go ahead and populate with a few of them here. Depending on who is the current monster controller or NPC controller, mm -hmm. whoever's in charge of running them, that'll be determined by this little symbol down here in the corner. Uh, and by player order, mm -hmm. you will move and populate the board based on your own preferences. <laughs> when it is your turn to do so. Yeah, so there's a there's a caveat in there. So every NPC is always going to follow their protocol, which we kind of touched on initially. For However, instance, mm -hmm. Spanish Galleons always want to liberate a port. So yep. if a port is currently under siege, they will try to go there. Mm -hmm. The Skeletons always want to huddle in one large mass. So mm -hmm. if there's an opportunity for them to get closer to each other, they will move in that direction. Yeah. And finally, the mermaids in our current game always want to make it to a far corner to pick up a relic for themselves yep. and return it back here to, towards 
and return it back here towards Tatuga. Mm -hmm. So they will do that if possible. Here's the thing. Between here and this corner, there are some Spanish galleons yep. in the way. Or, for instance, if you were here, in between these two skeletons, mm -hmm. and they decided to convene conveniently on your location, <laughs> you convenient. are now engaged in a battle. Yep. And here's the difference. So if an NPC initiates a battle, they will get to activate different abilities that they have, okay? So for example, if you ever lose a battle that skeletons initiated, you will lose half your gold to the skeletons. And then those, that skeleton crew is just gonna walk around with all your gold. Yeah, or down here, mm -hmm. the mermaid and the Spanish galleon will actually go head to head against each other. They're not friendly if they're not on the same faction. Nope. So NPCs can run into and destroy each other. That's part of the balancing act of players controlling the mob. Mm -hmm. And here's an important factor about that. So in this exact case that you have here, the Merfolk go, went ahead and initiated combat. However, there is an adjacent enemy right next door. So because we are in the NPC phase, they have a little bit more abilities to do. If the Galleons have not completed all their movement, they would be able to come in here and add allies to that combat and you might even be able to wipe everybody out or wipe a particular faction depending on how you play it. Or if San Juan mm -hmm. was a location that was currently under siege, you might be able to move this one in, mm -hmm. engage with that galleon and move this one over to San Juan. Yep. Or go ahead and move both of these out before you move the mermaid mm -hmm. in. It really comes down to where you want the game state to be and how you want certain factions on the board to progress. The way that it's described in the rule book, you always have to be as efficient as possible whenever you're making your moves. So try to make sure that whatever you do, you meet those objectives. Yeah. So with that being said, I think we can get into the port actions. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be your next opportunity. So if you resolve a movement with your player, your hero, and don't actually run into anyone that you need to fight, or you're on a location even with another player, but decide not to engage them in combat, mm -hmm. you can choose to do the indicated port action. Now we already briefly went over these, yeah. but for re refresher, let's go ahead and touch on each one very, mm -hmm. very quickly. So, this is the tavern port, okay? When you reach a tavern, you will grab the top card, and as Jesse said, you will read out pirate game that's there, then you'll read some rumors. Those rumors are either going to point you towards a consumable, something you will keep, mm -hmm. or a relic, which is a token that'll go on the board that you'll be able to identify that that is where you pick up your particular relic. Obviously, no one else can take that relic from you because you're the sure. only one that knows the rumor. You're the only one that knows the secret. <laughs> After that, we have where we can recruit our crewmates. So every time we go to that space, we will draw three cards and we'll be able to pay these crew members however much we want to bring them onto us. So for example, if we have three crews all worth of two and we have six coins, we can bring them all on our ship. We have space if your ship has the capacity to deal with that amount of crew, okay? You're able to cycle your crew in and out. So if you ever have a complete formation of crew members there and you want to bring somebody in new, you can just swap them out, okay? Just drop them off the boat. I, sure, drop drop them off the boat, of course. So, and uh, that they will give you new abilities as we already stated. After that, we have our hideouts. So hideouts are really special and you're probably gonna use them a lot in this game. So as we said, your captain can get hurt. They might get wounded. And every time you get wounded, that means you're gonna have less things that you're gonna be able to roll with, and the weaker you are in this game, the more of a target you become. So going into a port is going to help you heal all those wounds, it's going to let you reactivate things that you might have activated, and it's going to let you bury treasure. So if you ever have seven or more coins, you can go to a port and bury that treasure in order to gain one notoriety, okay? And finally, we have our carpenter's area. The carpenter is very simple, you'll grab this deck, and from this deck, you will have a series of ship cards and you're able to buy them. Level twos or threes. Mm -hmm. And you can upgrade the whole way from a level one to a level three if you have the indicated gold coin yep. available or at a discounted price, you can go from a level two to a level three as well. Yeah, for sure. So you might be asking, um, in addition to adding that health, why would a hideout be important? Well, that's because every time that you use a card or you use a crewmate, you're going to tap that card and you're not gonna be able to employ them in the future. So when you go into that hideout, it's just that we never touched on it, that we tap mm -hmm. cards. So is it is it okay if I intersect with this? Yeah. Okay, so, so when you go into that hideout, you'll be able to untap all those crewmates and bring them back into the fray so you can keep working. And as you'll notice, you have to keep tabs of other players on the board because they're filthy, stinking pirates and they're probably stealing a bunch of gold. So be sure to be mindful of your surroundings. Now, the last thing we'll do with ports 
is rating. So every single port is going to have a raid value. That value is going to be determined obviously by the board and you're going to have to meet or exceed that in order to conquer that port. If you successfully do so, you will do two things. First, you will look at the symbol that is right next to the green banner that supports the raid amount and you'll get that. So for example, red is always going to give you notoriety mm -hmm. and gold is well gonna give you gold. Gonna right? give you a bonus of gold, yeah. After that, you will take one of your banners, as Jesse has already demonstrated, and you will, by, by the way, you, you totally couldn't conquer those three places no, I totally, like that. I'm no, you didn't. I'm pretty sure I had all of those. Sure, okay, okay. Don't believe his fable. So, you'll be able to add your banner. And once you add your banner, at the beginning of every round, when it's your turn, you'll be able to get two coins in addition to whatever it is that you were able to accumulate. So there is a big benefit to collecting these ports and getting control of everything as fast as you can. So those are the actions you can take when you arrive at a location, don't engage with a battle, and decide mm -hmm. to engage with a port. The other third option you have in your game is to do one of your narrative-driven mm -hmm. events, which are going to be dictated based off of what you've already accomplished and where the actual story tells you your next quest is mm -hmm. going to be. And that works really seamlessly. So as we said, the app here is, is more of a tool to help you streamline your game. It facilitates the interweaving of stories, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't be able to do without it. Yeah, so the way that it will work, as soon as you arrive to a location, you will tell whoever's holding the iPad or whoever is to your left to read out a particular text. You will choose from a list of possible outcomes. For, so for example, if you are working with Kahina and you have Olivia, Valentine, and your captain's crew, you will tell the other player where you are at, located currently, and you'll click on that. That will give you a small portion of text, a paragraph, usually very thematic and pertaining to the particular quest you're following, and it'll give you instructions. Mm -hmm. It'll either tell you, you have gained this much, you have lost this health, you have to do a dice roll, and then you'll tell the app what happened. Mm -hmm. After that result is concluded, it will give you a possible bonus or boon. It will tell you if your characters have advanced in any way. Mm -hmm. And they will tell you where you're going to place the next step of your adventure on the board. So you're always going to be forced to move around, explore as much as you can in order to fulfill those particular adventures. And so, before we leave this point, let's talk a little bit more in depth about our different characters sure. or side partners that are going to be joining us through this adventure. So, for example, I'm showing you here both a lover and a nemesis. They're very similar. However, one is a positive thing and the other one is a very negative thing. So, as you start progressing through a lover storyline, you're going to be able to level up that character. Mm -hmm. And that character is now going to give you new things that you're going to be able to activate. There's two types of things that you're going to be able to activate. Either a passive ability mm -hmm. or an ability that you have to trigger based on the symbols that you have rolled in your dice as Jesse demonstrated before. So here with Valentine behind the mask, assigning two rows, two roses during combat with an NPC to lower their strength score. So that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Then, and as exquisite profit, this becomes a passive ability. So it says that every time you win a combat, you gain two gold. And finally, at the very end, you will get True Love, which will give you an additional notoriety on top of the two yeah. you're already initially earning. Yep. Now, Nemesis are going to be the, the complete opposite. other side of the equation. <laughs> They're going to be things that the storyline, as you progress maybe down your lover's path, the Nemesis will become slightly stronger, or mm -hmm. as you progress down your storyline, potentially my Nemesis will be buffed by them. <laughs> yes. So for instance, here with Magpie, their first skill point is going to allow them to pilfer. Mm -hmm. For each sword rolled, I'm gonna lose one gold, and That's that really resolves bad. immediately, mm -hmm. right when I roll that sword. Second level is going to be Thieving Birds. Whenever you gain gold, you instead gain two less. Ow. Okay, yeah. that's not fun. Not good. <laughs> and the final level here is going to be flinch. If you roll three or more daggers, discard an item. Wow. So as you can tell, your nemesis are going to be a thorn on your side for the entirety of the game. So that's why... But if you go down their path... Exactly. You can remove their ability to do some of their mm -hmm. actions limiting them to ever cause you to flinch. Yep. So there's definitely a lot of triggers in this game to kind of incentivize you to move forward with the storylines because at the end of the day, it is really one of the main ways you'll win. Yeah. And then finally, with your main character, mm -hmm. there is going to be an upgraded side as well. So for instance, here with Tone, on the first side, a big hit, rolling two of these or more, is going to do plus two to my combat yep. score. The second side here, the fully upgraded side, is going to be a critical hit. 
you can add plus one for each additional one. Wow. Roll. So you don't want to mess with Tone is what you're saying. Not if he is fully leveled up. <laughs> My god. Um, and this is the type of elements you'll be able to tableau build as you move through towards the game. Remember, you have your relic cards that you're going to be able to activate. Mm. You have your lovers that you're going to be able to employ depending on what you're doing. And finally, your crew members, which are so important in order to mitigate those dice rolls. So there's a lot of space here to kind of maneuver around and get what you need at the time you need it from. Yes, yeah, so that's gonna be the core structure of the game. Really throughout your turn, you're going to be deciding between moving and then resolving one of those three core mechanics. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot of depth and a lot of opportunity to play in the sandbox during those three interwoven moments, but really the structure of the game is composed around them deciding to deal with Nemesis mm -hmm. by attacking, fighting, battling, gaining relics, going to a port, resolving, upgrading, earning or burying gold, and then finally, or potentially going on an adventure and resolving or increasing your storyline. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna wanna be able to balance and deal with all of them throughout the course of the adventure. Yep. It's gonna be harder for you to deal with the big bad guys during combat if you haven't upgraded your ship. It's gonna be harder for you to upgrade your ship if you haven't mediated or went on some of your storytelling adventures. It's really gonna be a balance point mm -hmm. and that's gonna come down to your own gameplay style. Yeah, so the last thing I'd like to do is let's go through a really quick round of as, a, as an example to show them how a round would, nortu, uh, would naturally be. Sure. And from there we can conclude. Sure. So let's go ahead and assume that we're going to, we're just going to randomly place our story markers and we're going to randomly place our characters, but we will make sure to go and be as thorough as possible when it actually comes to the specifics of the turn, right? I'm gonna go and place to Kahina right here on Thieves Landing. What about I'm you? I'm gonna start in the open ocean here. Perfect. So let's go ahead and place the galleons. Usually if we were to go through a more comprehensive of setup, the galleons usually get placed in random CE regions, but regardless, now we start the game. So, first of all, Kahina is going to be the NPC controller I of like this round. I like how you moved that right as you were introducing <laughs> Well, hey, it states that whoever's first on North gets the player, the NPC controller okay. first, okay? Okay, so Kahina is going to be our NPC controller for this round. So the way that it'll work is that Kahina will be able to take advantage of whatever action she wants to do on her turn. For example, Kahina can go ahead and move to spaces. So, right now I have different venues that I can take. I can go ahead and get a crew member because at the beginning of the game, we both start off with seven coin. Mm -hmm. So I might use that coin to get some new crew members immediately, but it might not be the best idea. I have a pretty full ship right now. My crew is only up to four. So maybe I just kind of want to advance things and start getting some good points in and get some things that can help mitigate future actions that I do. So I have right here in San Juan, my very first captain adventure. So I can go ahead and decide to move. So one, two, and I'm now at San Juan. That's not yours. Yeah, I'm Kahina, you you changed me. Ah, oh. <clears throat> okay. So I can go ahead and move one, two, and now I'm at San Juan and I can fulfill that action. I will go to my iPad, I will select Kahina, I will say that she's in San Juan, and the app will tell us what happened. It'll say something along the lines of you're spending time on the bow of your ship overlooking mm -hmm. the waves and you approach San Juan and your lover leans over to your side, wrapping an arm <gasps> around you and tells you of maybe a place or a village that they really mm. wanted to visit. Potentially <laughs> something that they've heard rumor of over yep. in Thieves Landing. Yep, and then this will go ahead and move towards Thieves Landing, Yep. Uh, which I can't find right now, right here where we were. And we will continue our quest. And of course, now you'll notice that I, in my next turn, I could potentially go to Cartagena. Mm -hmm. There's so many different uh, avenues. So Tone, what would you do on your turn? So, I mean, it's pretty clear right here, my nemesis is going to be easily accessible here in Tortuga. Mm -hmm. uh, I would start moving into this location and try to deal with and probably get rid of that bottom ability because yeah. that thing is nasty. Yeah, it's really, really bad. So I'd pull this token. Maybe I would be dealing with magpie, maybe shooting some birds mm -hmm. out of the sky or hearing rumor of where the magpie has recently flown and potentially disqualifying or limiting his ability to keep on screwing with me. Mm -hmm. And then I hear that he has gone over to Smuggler's Cove. Ah, uh, coward. Yeah, he's been <laughs> he's been hiding in the uh, in the recesses of that location. And so then I need to work my way in that direction to continue his narrative. And so finally, after all players have gone, now you will initiate the NPC movement step, mm -hmm. okay? So that will work by flipping this card, which is a card that we explained before that controls, and you will read whatever level is corresponding to what the level is on the card. So here, for example, we have our undead soldier. Currently, we are just at level three, right? Because there's no token to indicate that we have moved on to level four. 
So because that, we read only the text right here that says, place an undead soldier on Smuggler's Cove and Cartagena. So now we immediately have two new enemies that we have to worry about and that NPC card gets discarded. So Smuggler's Cove and Cartagena, Cartagena and Smuggler's Cove. Now the NPC controller is able to initiate those movements and mm -hmm. try to make things happen. So here's the thing. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this. First and foremost, remember, if your characters can fulfill their conditions or the NPCs can fulfill their conditions, you must try and do it as efficient as possible. If that is not the case, you can kind of control them however you want. So let's say for instance, say St. John down here was actually controlled by you. Mm -hmm. You're actually going to have to script those galleons based off of that. Yeah, so the ga galleons would move in that direction. As close as they can to St. Mm -hmm. John. Now here with the skeletons, they actually want to coalesce into one form mm -hmm. union, meaning that they would move into these two locations, yep. putting them one space away from each other. Now, depending on when and how you move this mm -hmm. galleon, they will then engage in yeah. a combat. And so let's go ahead and actually do a combat round right now, sure. at least for the NPC so that we can explain how that works. Well, I'll fight you. Oh, okay, I, I, we were just gonna resolve them. So but... let's demonstrate how the NPCs work and then let's <laughs> demonstrate how a player versus player combat would work. Okay, so NPC turns are going to be very straightforward. The NPCs will compare their combat value. As we said, if there are no allies around them or if their allies already wasted their movement step in this phase, no one will be able to come to their aid and they will just have to resolve whatever they have. So right now, our Spanish Galleon has four strength versus a three strength. So goodbye to Mr. Skeleton, he is out. Now, the Undead Soldier provides three gold when he is defeated, so now that Spanish Galleon is worth three gold in addition to whatever the Galleon was worth when it started, okay? So that is how you would resolve an NPC movement and obviously this will be determined based on conditions when, and what new factions you might have on your board. So now, do we begin our own combat, sure. sir? let's do our mm, own, our own okay. little battle. So right now we are both pretty healthy. We're fine. So we can just start our, our abilities. So who's the attacker here? Uh, I believe I moved into you. So at the start of my turn, I'm always gonna have these four initial dice mm -hmm. pulled. Now, I haven't really upgraded anything here. Bad so move. I could tap to move an additional region, which I did to move into your zone, mm -hmm. let's say that. Uh, before I roll for a challenge, I may tap to get an additional die. Let's go ahead and do my gunner. So that's your first bonus die. Uh, and then I could tap to change a rose into a powerful guy or heal. Mm -hmm. uh, and none of my none of my people resolve, right now. Right now resolve mm -hmm. things. So let's see here. So I have two roses. Oh. I have one of my captains, and I have three total damage coming your way. That's now, not bad. If I had any daggers, they would resolve immediately. I don't. Uh, my two roses. So I could actually tap this guy mm -hmm. to go ahead and cycle one of my roses into my powerful ability. And that'll give you a bonus. Which will give me a bonus from tone. Mm. So I have a total value of five damage coming your way because this rose does not trigger her ability. Mm -hmm. I have three from the numbers themselves and then two additional damage coming from my pirate wheel or my captain ability. Because supposedly you upgraded your captain, right? I did, my captain's been upgraded this whole time. Oh, okay, sure, sure, sure. So <laughs> I think you made a tactical blunder here because I start with my four, but I had upgraded my ship initially. Okay. To have more combat value. So I had upgraded to a seahorse earlier in the turn. They saw it. Like, okay. Like it totally happened, 100%. Okay. And when I did that, I now have a strength of four base dice. Okay. So I would draw my first four, mm -hmm. and then I would add all my cannons as we talked about before. And this is going to be my initial pool okay. of actions. Then I'm going to go ahead and maybe tap my gunner as well to get an mm -hmm. additional die. You never know what could happen in these waters, yeah, right? That's true. You have to be careful. It's true. You have to be very careful. And then I'm going to roll all my dice and see what I get. Okay, so I have currently two plus three of my shields right here. Let's see. Oh, okay. So as one of my special abilities, I'm going to get the... No, 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 but I had forgotten to discard my power keg. Oh, really? Okay. Which what actually with gives keg? me three additional dice during my oh, turn. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I, I would have, I would have actually had Seven. an additional three damage coming oh, your way. It so is true. eight total damage. Okay. Is what I had. Okay. Yeah, okay. Just well, everyone remembers that. Sure, sure, sure. Of course they do. So in an actual legal turn, mm -hmm. right? In an actual legal mm -hmm. turn, I would have a base of two 
From that base of two, I'd be able to activate my captain's ability. Okay. Kahina's captain ability says, I can draw from the tavern deck until I find a consumable and I claim it immediately. <laughs> so hand me the deck, cause I'm gonna find a really powerful consumable and take you down with it. No, there we go. So this card to change all lovers and captain's icons as ones. So I'm gonna go ahead and do exactly that to change all of these to ones. I don't think I actually beat you, but still, I tried my very, very darndest best. So you could change all that to ones, and let's see, do I have anything else? And so, I was able to get eight, which is uh, pretty good. But I was also able to get eight. Yeah, and so, in a combat round, as we say to the attacker, always wins ties. So, I would lose half my gold, Jesse would take all of that. Thank you. And I will just uh, retreat to my hideout later on in my turn. There's some change. Oh, th thank you, sir. And that is pretty much an entire round. After that, the NPC controller will move to the next character. We will reset, do our series of actions once more until somebody reaches those 10 notoriety. You continue going through the flow of the game, like you said, until someone reaches those 10 notoriety. Now remember, you're going to be trying to take down big guys, bury gold, gain relics, upgrade your ship, improve your crew, conquer ports, mm -hmm. and then finally, go down your narrative adventures with your hero, with your lover, mm -hmm. and with your nemesis, and whatever yeah. other people might pop up along the way, because after all, the seas are not empty <laughs> at all. In fact, yeah. some of these are NPCs that exist in the game state every single time you play. Yep. So there's a chance your story will intertwine or come in contact with them along the way. Mm -hmm. And that's been a how to play video. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. We will be happy to answer. Also check out that Kickstarter. Make sure that you are up to date with everything that's going on. And I think before you go, if you've made it to this point of the video, we just like to request, uh, maybe take a second to subscribe. No, thanks so much for being here. Uh, <laughs> whatever you do though, remember to do the <laughs> Are we really thing? not gonna push subscribes at all? Get out and play some games. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks so much.